Hello guys and welcome back to the course of uh, Vishyanant and we're going to continue with uh, another important uh, year for him it was 1995 and this was the time when he finally won the candidates if you remember in one of the previous videos we have seen a game of uh, him of, against Michael Adams this was played in the semi-final in the previous year and in the final he defeated uh, Gatakamski and he qualified to play um, a World Championship match against uh, Gary Kasparov in 1995. We will go uh, to this match, but just before this, the same year 1995, when the match was scheduled, uh, there, was, uh, there were of course a few tournaments before the match and Everybody was waiting to see um, when Anand will meet Kasparov before the match and what will happen. So maybe this can get some influence and give psychological boost for some of the players in the match. And there was one meeting and this was uh, in rapid chess. And we mentioned before that, of course, Kasparov was the best player, not only in classical, but in rapid at that time, but Anand already showed that especially in rapid he is very good because he was making decisions very quickly and he was playing really fast so it was interesting to see um, if now Anand can uh, do something against Kasparov and let's see now this first this game from the rapid tournament Anand is with white pieces and of course Kasparov goes for Sicilian and now um, of course, uh, Anand could play the main lines and he knows that Kasparov, of course, is yeah, probably the best player in Sicilian at that time. He understands the game like no one else and he decided to surprise him with the move Queen takes d4, which of course is not a better move than knight d4, but it just leads the game to completely different lines where everything is more kind of solid of course Anand first of all has to play so he is not under pressure and he doesn't lose the game and now of course the idea of this line is that you meet knight to six with bishop to b5 pinning the knight and then take it and uh, knight to three it could castle yeah, well, it can castle both ways so in order to avoid the spin, Kasparov now is trying to make the game more complicated and to lead it maybe in some kind of positions where Nant is not so well prepared as well. So he tries this move Bishop d7, which is uh, also probably not the best, but this is a move which uh, doesn't allow White to go Bishop d5 and on the next move the knight will arrive to c6, which will force white to move the queen. But of course, uh, this allows now white others uh, possible setups, like now c4, and uh, now queen d2, not queen d1, queen d2 is at least a uh, useful move, so if the game now goes to one of the lines in the Marozzi, if black decides to go with g6, then the queen is uh, better, of course, on d2. And this is exactly the moment where black has to decide in general what to do with the dark square bishop. He can, of course, go knight f6, e6, bishop e7, or he can go g6, bishop g7. But I think already when you play bishop d7, it doesn't make a lot of sense to go for e6. Because after that, the pawn on d6 is a little bit weak. You know, it could be long term when white moves the bishop and castles this bishop could land on a3 then one rook on d1 and suddenly uh, this bishop is not allowing black to defend the pawn easy so this is clear that black has to go g6 and this is some kind of yeah dragon marozzi line which is uh, probably is completely fine for black of course in the normal line, usually the knight is on d4, the bishop is on e3, and the pawn is on f3. Now, okay, black don't have any real problems, but uh, 
maybe a nant uh, has got what he wanted to bring the game into a different uh, setups and pawn structures and ideas than it was uh, in the Knight of Sicilian. Now the game is not that sharp. Rook b1, avoiding uh, all kind of traps like b3 and of course knight e4 and then you lose the rook. So rook b1 is uh, a standard move, so you can go b3 next. And basically what white is doing in the system is just to develop like bishop b2, rook d1 and then h3, bishop f1, some maneuvering. Yes, white is not threatening too much, but uh, also black don't have so many attacking and active plans. And now, okay, Kasparov is playing more or less like they do in this system. Queen a5 is a relatively standard move. And then, uh, I think we spoke earlier in some of the games about that when there is this uh, kind of pin with the queens and then there is this knight, Often white wants to play knight d5 and if uh, this pawn is not protected you can meet queen d2 with the intermediate check knight e7. Of course now it's not working because knight is there but anyway because of this black usually moves this rook to c8 so after knight d5 knight e7 he can go king f8 in many occasions and also like I mentioned I think exactly the same uh, early in, in one of the other games when you go b5 and white takes and black takes this rook now can do something against the pawn on a2 and white is playing this solid move and black now goes bishop to g4 also pretty standard idea it also reminds me a little bit of the perk there are some similar lines uh, oh but of course benoni sicilian and now white is just uh, maneuvering queen e3 defending the pawn and preparing knight d5 at some point. So usually here black sometimes just takes this knight and then goes knight d7 and then knight c5 and this is exactly what uh, Kasparov is doing. Very standard uh, move for this Marossi. Knight d7, he is not against uh, the trait of the dark square bishops because black is claiming that um, when white has those pawns on the light squares and he keeps the last light square bishop he is not that active and if you trade the dark square bishop then black can try to take control of the c5 or the e5 and maybe even long term on the d4 square when he trades this knight now white okay what to do not much okay one possible idea is sometimes a3 and b4 but okay, black will remove the queen somewhere and this could create some weakness on c4 long term. So he plays very safe move, knight d5. And now black starts to trade. He traded his bishops and we go into this position. Again, very kind of standard for those situations. And I think more or less it looks around equal. Yeah, this knight is strong. But white is not actually attacking anything. And now black has plenty of options, of course, to play. But uh, Kasparov now didn't show a lot of patience. And uh, he decided immediately to attack this knight, which I think was not forced. But he goes uh, e6. Now, of course, there is no check. Um, there is no point maybe to go b4 and uh, Anand now sim simply goes back. But actually, when black took on b2 and white moved the rook to b2, this uh, gives him now this uh, option to double the rooks on the d-file. So white has a very very simple and clear plan. And uh, in order to justify the move e6, from Black's point of view, he must play something aggressive because he just uh, has created this weakness and now there is no bishop to defend the pawn. Kasparov goes rook to d8, which is a uh, pawn sacrifice. 
Obviously, he had something in mind when, usually when you take such a pawn, uh, you have to be careful for some move with the knight, like knight e5. And then the point is that, okay, imagine that this looks like a normal move. And I suppose that black has to take, and then white has to take. Here, some way, you have to try to find out where is the compensation from black's point of view, why Kasparov is offering this pawn. And to be honest, I don't see something uh, special after this, let's say, take-take. White is defending everything. The best is simply to go there and exchange the rook, but this is extra pawn. Yes, uh, there is some positional compensation, because the bishop indeed is not that good, but nothing uh, special. And also even Anand, uh, I'm sure that of course he was looking at this move, but then he thought, okay, now I can take the pawn. But even if I bring the other rook, this could be even, even, even better, because he still cannot defend the pawn. I have already two hits, and when you take now this rook, yeah, you control the file. So Kasparov went for this line, so I think more or less rook d6 leads to the previous position. But, again, Anand, a bit surprisingly, um, he may be still wondering why Kasparov is giving this pawn, maybe there is something, when, when Kasparov is offering something, you don't expect that he's blundering, especially with this move e6, it was clear that the pawn is weak. And he maybe thought, okay, let's just play a little bit more cautious. This pawn is still weak. Let's see, let's move the bishop first. Now, f4 is coming. This knight has only one square, but when he goes back, then already rook d6. Let's say he goes queen c7, f4, knight d7, rook d6 now looks even better. And here, indeed, uh, this is also a good move, and Black still cannot defend the pawn. Um, the most stubborn move was f6, which is not an obvious move. Uh, and then again, he just have to play without a pawn, the same kind of position, but just to have this square for the knight in case of f4. And yeah, white is definitely better. But instead, okay, this move is a little bit uh, mysterious. Kasparov is trying to create something, he goes knight to b4. It looks like an active move, yeah, you are putting pressure on a2, um, maybe some b5 ideas, d5 if he doesn't take the pawn, and once again, this actually is already becomes a little bit funny for three moves, Anand, he can take the pawn, okay, in this case, he has to calculate, because rook takes, rook takes, and then knight a2, and this really is Okay, knight e2, he also takes the pawn, so you have to see. Instead, he prefers to play this strange move, uh, h4, which I'm sure that it's not the best. Again, it gives uh, time to Kasparov, okay, if he wants, maybe he can drop the queen, try to defend the pawn. But then those knights, okay, there is always, after this a3, there is always f4. And this is a long-term uh, weakness. So Kasparov doesn't want to wait, and especially in the rapid game, sometimes when the time is ticking away and you just try to play something more active to create problems for your opponent, let him think, uh, and he goes b5, which looks like yeah, the only active move which black can do, but simply um, white takes the pawn. And then what can you do with black? Only to take. And now I think in general white can capture with ball, but he takes with the knight. So already extra pawn. The pawn on d6 remains weakness. Maybe Kasparov thought that here there could be something on a2. Uh, now, he suddenly decided to move the knight back. This is a, a bit of a strange move, but uh, 
I think the problem was that, first of all, if you go d5, I just take. And then this is hanging. So if there is no d5, then, then what to do? Knight e2, probably rook a1 is coming. And even now a3 is coming as some kind of threat. And then you have to move the knight and then b4. So he realized that this is not leading to anywhere. And uh, even now, of course, again, you can take the pawn. I don't know how many moves already this pawn is hanging, but no, Anand says I want to protect the A pawn. A3 first, and then, okay, what to do for black? He has to push the pawn, now at least the knight is protected. But white is playing very simple chess in this game, and this is enough for him, because now he managed to go B4, and uh, you have to move the queen, queen D8. I suppose queen c5 is possible, anything is possible. Queen a4 was played, and after rook d5, uh, Kasparov actually had resigned the game. This game was very simple and, I don't know, easy for white, you see. From the opening, he played some normal moves, more or less equal position, and then um, after knight d5, he just yeah, waited to see what Kasparov will do. And when Kasparov played this e6 and then he created this weak pawn on d6, the only thing Anand did is to, to go there, double the rooks, put pressure on the pawn. Already it was difficult for Kasparov, he decided to give another pawn. Then White just took this pawn, then he collected the second pawn and game over. So sometimes this actually is uh, the way how you should play against such a players very very strong, just play solid. And then when they have uh, less possibilities to create something active and attacking, they try to create something out of nothing, but uh, it often creates uh, weaknesses like now. So you just have to play normal and punish the mistakes which uh, they make. Okay, so now we are arriving finally to the World Championship match, who was later in the year in September in 1995. Um, and Kasparov against Anand, of course, you everybody knows what happened in those matches, it was a long time ago. Kasparov won the match, uh, but it was not so straightforward, uh, because for a long time it was uh, equal. There were many, 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 many draws, and uh, um, at some point, I think it was between the 10th and 15th games, this was uh, what Kasparov said after the match, that in this period of time he he won the match, because then he won, uh, I think, two games, and in the end it was 4-1 and 13 draws. Uh, so there were some competitions, I think, uh, because of the amount of the draws, so it was for the first time from the this famous Cup of Kasparov match, so many draws on the row. And later, when uh, Kasparov was uh, discussing the match, he said that probably Anand had a wrong strategy. And he said that maybe the mistake of, of his team was that they didn't take into account that this is a World Championship match, not an ordinary tournament. And you, every day you have to play with what's obviously a very strong player. So you have to adjust sometimes the openings and things like this. Uh, and he said that the, they just uh, decided to play only the same things and uh, they didn't adjust it during the match. But anyway, uh, we're going to see yeah, the best game of Anand of this match. Here he was also playing with white, but this time again it was Sicilian, like uh, the game which we have just seen from the Rapid Championship. But this time Anand uh, goes for the main lines. And uh, after a6, of course, now we're waiting to see which line the knight will choose. You know, f4, bishop e3, bishop g5, bishop c4, bishop e2, plenty of lines. And this time he decided to play like Karpov in the old days uh, from the 80s, the uh, standard uh, classical line bishop e2. Now, here, when you play bishop e2, with white you have to be ready for many things, but in general, black uh, has to decide 
the main thing is between E6 or E5. This is just a different kind of setups and positions. E6 is kind of more flexible for black, but also it allows white to attack more because you can push F4, sometimes even G4, G5. With E5 the game is more closed and after F4 black can always take and then this is more positional game. Of course Kasparov prefers more double edge and sharp E6. Uh, and also of course with his experience when he was facing Karpov long time ago so he knew in general this line very very well. Bishop E7 and now A4, yes. This is uh, the main choice here now between um, bishop e3 and f4. In this case, white is allowing b5, and usually he reacts with a3. Or you can play a4 to stop the move b5, but then of course it gives uh, other possibilities for black, like the b4 square is sometimes is exposed, and this knight can try to go there. Knight c6, bishop e3, castle f4 and queen c7 oh this is uh, well known there are plenty of games this is a very very old line and now white again he has to choose king h1 queen e1 bishop f3 i think those uh, even some people go knight b3 there are yeah, different uh, ideas but king h1 was the choice of vichy anand a uh, very standard uh, waiting move because often when you later drop the queen to e1 and g3 at some point uh, black has this idea knight d4 followed by e5 and when you take pawn takes pawn takes then the bishop arrives with c5 and then there could be some checks or of course it could be some queen b6 ideas if this is not defended so this is a very king h1 is very uh, useful move now black has to decide how exactly to, to develop the bishop the rooks and Kasparov goes for rook e8. This is also very standard from black's point of view, rook e8. Uh, the idea is that the bishop goes back to f8 and then sometimes black can try to push e5 in the best possible moment and the rook is helping for this cause, also making way for the bishop to defend on g7 in case of attack. Bishop f3. Now, yeah, this is a very standard move as well, and the idea is to fight against uh, b6. And now black, uh, yeah, he doesn't have a big choice what to do with this light square bishop. He has to go to d7. And here, again, now what are the ideas in this situation? White can move the queen, like queen d2, rook d1, and just to set up some kind of central strategy. Or if he wants to attack on the king side, usually he goes queen e1, queen g3, looking for e5 or f5. Um, but what black wants to do, black usually, he wants to take knight d4, to follow up with b5, because the bishop is supporting b5, and then you have b5, before, of course, after b5, e5 now maybe is a thing, so first he can move the rook. Or he can take on d4, bring the bishop to c6 to provide pressure on the pawn, and then to go to b5, or to go to d5, e5, knight e4, or to go to e5 when he has bishop on c6 and to try to hit the pawn with the rook. But basically, knight d4 is a very essential part of the plan. That's why Anand uh, makes this a little bit strange move if you haven't seen those type of position, he removes the knight to b3. Yes, the knight on b3 looks very bad, but the idea is that you are now uh, making the life difficult for black because he cannot improve the bishop very easy. He wants to go to c6, but this knight is there. And now what do you do with this knight? Also, this knight is not allowing b5, not allowing rook c8 to to provide some counterplay, so he has to go either to b4, either to a5. And to b4 it looks nice, but it's not threatening something immediately. And white can push a5, and then I think this is some kind of idea, 
and then to go bishop b6 at some point. Uh, so knight e5 is uh, more or less standard move. I have also made similar moves in similar positions with black. Um, yeah, the idea is just to give more space to the bishop, for the queen, for the rook, and to allow b5 at some point. Now you cannot go back um, to d4 even if you want to make a draw because knight c4 is coming. So either you allow knight b3, but then you have to double the pose, or you take, and then takes, takes, and now um, he has to find what is the plan, and he again decided to play a bit more solid and centralized. It games actually, this game reminds me a little bit of the previous one, where Adan simply puts uh, his pieces in the center without trying to attack on the king side or to do something spectacular. Queen d3. And here, Kasparov this time, <laughs> I think because of the experience with the previous game where he had issues with the d-pawn. Now, instead of moving the rook to c8, which is what uh, 90% of the people in Sicilia are doing automatically. The rook belongs to the c-file. Now he decided to go to d8, which is a very not Sicilian move. But he was uh, concerned about maybe this uh, d6 pawn. But why this move now is not so good? Now let's see. White is making again very centralized move and then bishop to c6 so it looks like yeah black is completely fine and those moves i think they have the same idea to support the move d5 uh, and it seems that white now is running out of useful moves rook c1 doesn't make a lot of sense and black is ready for, to push d5 or e5 and suddenly um, Anand finds a very interesting move, which could be missed from Kasparov. I'm not sure, but it's very easy to miss such a move before uh, before us played. I had a similar example <laughs> facing another Indian player. Uh, it was Ramesh, the famous coach. We had one game many years ago, and uh, in the opening he surprised me with such a move like before in the park which I didn't know. He was playing extremely fast and I didn't take the pawn. Uh, yeah, so now I remember this game because I had very similar uh, uh, meeting with such a move before. And Kasparov now, okay, what to do? He either takes on before, either goes to c7. Okay, of course, what will happen if you go there? The queen obviously is almost trapped, and now after rook b1, um, there is only one move which makes sense to a5, and then there is bishop b6. Uh, also, of course, a5 could be possible, and then rook b1, but definitely, maybe yes, there could be some sacrifices, bishop b4, but yeah, black is losing. So he has to go to c7. And then the follow-up is immediately b5. So this has allowed white to gain a lot of space and also black is kind of losing time because he, he, his previous move was bishop to c6. Now he has to go back and he goes back without uh, trading the pawn to open the file. Uh, he has to see what uh, will happen if white takes, but actually white cannot win the pawn because the knight is hanging in the air. So the only thing which white has to decide is to, to open the b-file by taking like this, or just to, to move the rook. And he preferred to move the rook to b1 to give more protection to the pawn, and now he wants to, to go pawn takes bishop b6, also he wants to go rook to b3 to give protection to the knight in case black attacks it. And again now Kasparov has some issues uh, to find an active plan. And he is the guy who cannot just sit and wait, he has to, to do something active. And for him such a 
positions where he has to just defend and just stay at the back and not that not that good um, and now he is wondering okay what to do he takes on b5 and now white has to decide uh, to take with the pawn or to take with the knight um, this is uh, very different for the pawn structure if you take with a piece with a knight in this case then you uh, long term would have the pawn on c2 okay anyway you have this pawn on c2 but also you have the pawn on the a file so maybe when black goes queen a5 or rook a8 or something like this in the future this pawn could be weak but from the other hand this will keep the b file open for the rook so the b7 pawn as well is weak so this is tricky here um anand takes with the knight and here black also has to deal suddenly with the threat of knight takes d6 yes it needs some calculation because obviously the, the rook is over there but it is a possibility let's say if you move the queen somewhere uh, knight d6 is possible because bishop takes queen takes it's fine if you go bishop to c6 then white has e5 to defend the knight forever um so Kasparov was wondering now what to do with this knight. Normally you don't want to take this knight. You prefer to move the queen. And if you have time for bishop c6, the bishop will be very good on c6. But maybe there was knight d6. So in the end he takes. And now again white has this choice which, what to take. And it, he decided to leave the pawn on the a-file. Uh, because he thought that uh, she will be not weakness, but she can be actually maybe very important asset. Because if you can win the b-pawn, let's say you take this and you lose this. So you have the pawn on a4 and you have those two bishops who are pointing towards a7 and a8. And if you can push a5, a6, then already, and to defend it with the bishop somehow, this pawn could be a game changer. So he keeps the pawn. And now rook b8 is of course some possibility, but maybe bishop a7 and then you have to to move the rook. So Kasparov is fighting against this pawn. He knows that she is the, the most important, not this. Black has to target to take this pawn because the c2 pawn is not dangerous. Uh, okay, so white is protecting the pawn in this case. And... Uh, now, I don't know, rook a5 is some option in general, and then, okay, this is not hanging, and if queen b7, then those two pawns are weak, or white can just drop the queen back to b3. In the game, I think uh, Kasparov had some doubts about e5, then pawn takes, pawn takes, when after knight 7 maybe white can, okay, knight 7 is not possible, because there is a the rook sorry but this could open the way um, for the bishop to take on b7 and then it will be very dangerous if the bishop lands on b7 and then a5 a6 a7 just wins so he's closing this diagonal um, yeah now it looks like black is doing not so bad because again if you take this pawn and you give the a4 pawn Mm, I don't think that black has some problems. Anand decided to go bishop to b6 in order to secure the move a5. Black goes back to c8 and now takes, takes, and uh, the exchange of the pawns now did some things. First of all, has opened the d file, so this knight cannot move too much. And also now white has those two pawns against one. So he can push both to c5 and a5. And then he has some pressure because he's looking at some moment to exchange either c6, either a6 and to create a, a pass pawn. So he starts with a5. And again, now you see black has a lot of problems to find what to do. Basically, white is controlling a very big part of the board the knight cannot move the rook cannot move the other rook not too much q4 
queen to six will be a big mistake because I was just taken then this pawn is a pass pawn and what to do he just goes bishop to f8 and here already Anand clearly sees that he has a big advantage and this is a type of positions where when you have learned from the old games from the legendary players uh, they said always that you should not hurry when you have advantage positional and your opponent is running out of useful moves you should not try to force something unless you win you just have to keep slowly to improve to improve and to stop any kind of counterplay which he can even think that's why here the move the next move is h3 of course this is not the best move but it shows what kind of confidence and uh, belief Anand has in his position because he sees that black doesn't have what to do so he is just uh, yeah making some room for the king long term stopping all kinds of knight g4 ideas and then just asking okay it's your move what are you going to do and Kasparov has to do something queen to e6 and then yeah try to coordinate his pieces and here the next move is really very very beautiful um, I think yeah white can play yeah, basically anything but still it's not it's not totally winning yes you are better but there is no threat uh, there is no clear plan that you just go and take something so you have to show something some some plan and now he goes rook to d5 which is a move uh, to demonstrate again big confidence and uh, just to show okay you see how good how good position I have I can afford to play this move because if you take my rook I take with the e pawn and then I have some pass pawns if you don't take then I have two hits on e5 so you cannot move the queen you cannot move the rook and yeah he is looking maybe even to double the rooks and just to keep improving so Kasparov